Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hello, welcome back to uh, lectures on thermoelectricity from atom, uh, atoms to systems. Um, this is uh, lecture two where we discuss uh, thermoelectric measurement techniques. Uh, last time we finished uh, by discussing how a scanning thermomicroscope works when you put an atomic uh, thermocouple at the tip of an atomic force microscope and some of the issues that are related that reduces the resolution limits. Um, here we want to sh show that this is not an inherent problem. There are examples where ultra-high vacuum scanning thermoelectric microscopy has been demonstrated where really atomic scale temperature and uh, thermoelectric measurement have been demonstrated. In this case, um, the tip is um, simple so you can make it extremely sharp. But the way it works is that the tip is uh, at room temperature and you have a heated uh, sample. As a result, when tip touch the sample, there is a temperature gradient created near the tip, and that temperature gradient uh, creates a thermoelectric voltage that we want to measure. Of course, you need to monitor the position of the tip, and that you do it with a preamplifier. Um, but um, as soon as you know that you are in the right position, then you can switch and measure what is the voltage that is uh, generated uh, due to this temperature difference. Uh, uh, this type of uh, 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 measurement system have shown to uh, basically uh, give a voltage. Um, originally, uh, people thought that the voltage is basically um, uh, related to the local Seebeck coefficient with some sort of a spatial distribution. And that's something that I want to emphasize later on that's not uh, strictly correct and how we can do better than this. So with these measurements, uh, people have characterized, this is an example of a epitaxially grown uh, p gallium arsenide, n gallium arsenide, and p gallium arsenide, so you have a p-n junction with good concentration of electrons and holes on the two sides. And here is the scanning region, and uh, here are the measured thermoelectric voltage in millivolt. As you can see, as you approach the junction, thermoelectric voltage is a positive value, goes to certain uh, a higher value, a peak, and then suddenly change a sign and go on down. This is as expected because on one side you expect to have p-type, uh, p thermoelectric type, volt, uh, positive, and the other side is uh, n, thermoelectric sign is negative, and you can see within a couple of nanometers the sign of thermoelectric and the value changes, so that's a very high precision localized measurement of the Seebeck coefficient. Um, uh, so you see very sharp transition. Resolution 6 nanometer based on this transition um, it, do, it does not necessarily mean resolution of 6 nanometer in temperature, and that's something I'm going to explain. It measures both carrier concentration and types because this voltage is directly related to um, Seebeck effect, which is a function of the carrier concentration, and the sign of it is related uh, to the fact, as you saw in the first lecture, by a professor data uh, that you have a hole or you have an electron. Let's discuss how the actual uh, uh, modeling of this is done. It seems simple, you have a p-n junction, I put a cold um, uh, probe and it creates a temperature difference. In reality, you need to calculate the temperature by some sort of finite difference. This is a, uh, this is a three-dimensional space. Uh, you need to solve Poisson equation. Uh, because uh, near this region there is um, carrier uh, electron and holes recombined and uh, there is a depletion region. Uh, distributed thermoelectric potential and resistive network need to be included in this model and the whole thing is solved using Kirchhoff's current and voltage law. So it seems uh, complicated, it's given in this uh, article, but at the end the results um, uh, can ex be explained relatively easily. What is the challenge? Here is a position in nanometer near the junction, and what is the thermoelectric voltage theoretically, and what is the grid resistance? Basically, at each location, if you put a tiny resistor, what is the value of that resistor? One thing to notice is, of course, on one side you have a thermoelectric <coughs> voltage negative, the other one thermoelectric voltage positive. 
this is due to the electrons, this is due to the holes, so you have a PN junction. But near the depletion, near the junction, near in the depletion region, the electrical uh, resistance or conductivity of material changes by many order of magnitude from 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 15. That 10 order of magnitude change has huge implications. Basically, at any point of the material, Seebeck voltage uh, that you measure by the solid line, uh, or you see by the solid line, is like a tiny battery. Next to it, you have another tiny battery. Each one of them have a tiny resistance associated with them. When you put batteries in parallel, the total voltage measured is not only measures of the uh, battery voltages, but also are given by the resistances of the network. Why? Because there is actually a current flow uh, happening internally in the circuit. And this internal current flow affects the output voltage. Even though I put a, um, a temperature, um, a voltage probe on top is a um, no current from output, internally this current affects the voltages that you measure. And that was some of the uh, insights from this paper. And using this type of theory, then you can explain the experimental results. So the thermoelectric voltage versus distance, this is the data point. And solid line, if perfect 1D, there was no heat distribution. By adding some uh, region where the temperature is um, basically given ballistically by a single value, and by changing the size of the tip, you can explain the trend of the data. So that tells you that this uh, scanning UHB Seebeck is very powerful, but you need to combine this with a good simulation tool in order to explain the experimental results. Um, now that we have learned this is small scale temperature measurement is a good opportunity to also discuss how people measure Seebeck coefficient of an individual molecule. In this case, uh, the molecule is shown here um, and is put between a probe and a surface with some special, special bonding. They make sure there is a single molecule in this configuration. Um, and they have a, one side heated with respect to the other, so this is ambient, this is a little hotter than ambient, similar to the previous case, but instead of the two touching each other, there is a molecule here. This work was first done by uh, Siegelman, Majumdar, and collaborators in 2007. Um, there is a process of how STM tip should approach and then withdrawn to ensure at certain time there is only a single molecule inside. Once they do that, they measure some uh, voltages, and here is uh, amount of voltage measured between the two electrodes at different delta t's. So you see voltage with uh, temperature difference scales. That's what we know as a Seebeck coefficient. This was the first case where a Seebeck coefficient of a single molecule was measured. Uh, what is the part of the uh, problem or part of the, that one has to be precise is that this is really not the Seebeck coefficient of that molecule. If you go back here, this molecule is in close proximity between two electrodes. So what we are measuring the Seebeck coefficient of electrode molecule electrode as a combined system, not individual molecule. Um, uh, what once you know about that, you can interpret this result and explain it. Uh, in each molecules, you have um, homo and lumo bonds, um, bands, and um, uh, depending on the transmission, you can have a value of the conductance. And the slope of this has to do with value of the thermal power. And basically, these measurements um, verified what they anticipated uh, of, uh, to see for this molecule. What is interesting is the theory that explains the thermoelectric voltage of a single molecule was uh, described uh, a couple of years earlier than this measurement by Professor Data and Paulson using uh, this uh, Green's function approach, uh, Landauer approach that you saw in uh, week one um, as well. So basically, uh, what matters when you calculate current uh, between two electrodes is the difference in the Fermi energy. And um, in the uh, transmission function, if you consider the energy dependence of it, uh, from that, you can calculate the Seebeck coefficient. So some of the things you learned on atomic scale uh, thermoelectrics um, uh, here kind of was uh, verified for the first time experimentally. 
Now that we have gone down to the smallest scale of an individual molecule, let's go back to our refrigerator, the 50 by 50 micron, and discuss what are other techniques to measure temperature, maybe non-contact techniques. One uh, non-contact technique is infrared microscope. This is a picture of an actual uh, microprocessor, in this case I think is AMD, that is working and you can see certain areas are hot, 87 degrees Celsius, certain areas are cooler, 50 degrees. This is on the centimeter scale. When you zoom in at the 70 micron scale of an individual refrigerator, you can also see this type of signals, but the difficulty is refrigerator is made of a metal on top and silicon around of it. Both of these materials are non-ideal for infrared measurement because metals have low emissivity and silicon is transparent. So in order to get this image, actually they had to paint it black. And that's one of the requirements for good infrared measurements is to do it at higher temperatures so you get rid of the background and you paint it. So again, it's not uh, purely non-contact because you have to modify the surface under study. Another method people have done uh, which is uh, called liquid crystal thermography is used on the larger scale. You basically uh, pay, put a paste of a liquid crystal on a chip and from the contours you can see when the temperature changes. This is a phase change. It happens at a very narrow temperature range so you can measure temperature in that narrow range quite precisely. It's the same way you measure fever of people by putting a little um, thermometer on their forefront. Um, uh, it's working, but again, it's not necessarily non-contact because you have to paint it. And there are issues uh, that deal with um, the fact that liquid crystal have aging problems. So you cannot, uh, you need to carefully um, uh, calibrate it in order to quantify the temperature measurement. The last uh, technique to measure temperature that I want to discuss uh, in this lecture uh, is called um, uh, scanning fluorescent microscopy. At the tip of some atomic probe uh, technique, you can put a particle uh, that you know that has some uh, given optical properties. And here these green lines are the, for example, dipole moments of this particle. Once, what happens if you put this particle near an object? The idea is that uh, in, in this case um, uh, uh, is um, erbium, ytterbium dope particles, they have a photoluminescence that have two peaks at 527 and 550 nanometer. Um, the two peaks correspond to the, this green and the yellow transitions here. The ratio of these two transitions has to do with the energy separation between two energy states. Basically, the intensity of green divided by intensity of yellow is given by an exponential factor, uh, uh, which is uh, exponential of the energy difference divided by kT. This is the Boltzmann occupation, the difference between the two energy level. By looking at the ratio of these two, we can measure the temperature of the nanoparticle. If we put the nanoparticle now next to a heater, in this case a heater is shown in a polycyclic on a silicon chip, you can measure the temperature. So this is an example of temperature measurement. Uh, it was done uh, in a paper in 2005. Again, the thermometer is the particle. Uh, you can, of course, always measure some temperature distribution, but the first question you should ask is, how accurate is the value of this temperature? Because if this nanoparticle that I put close to this junction, depending on how it touches the junction or how close it is, the values extracted uh, could change. So this is a good um, qualitative way to see temperature distribution, but to do it quantitatively uh, is very difficult. So here, uh, let me summarize what you learned in, in today's lecture. Uh, what we started is how you measure temperature at the smallest scale using uh, ultra-high vacuum scanning Seebeck uh, 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 measurement. Uh, we saw how it can be applied to measuring Seebeck um, coefficient of individual molecules. Some of the uh, issues to remember is how to analyze the data. If you are measuring Seebeck on a surface, where the CBEC is different at different locations, you need to consider some of the modeling. The raw data it doesn't give you the pure values. Um, then we moved on some of the optical technique, how to measure uh, temperature. We started with infrared microscopy, with uh, scanning fluorescence microscopy and liquid crystal thermography. 
Uh, these are various methods where the change in color and the change amount of light coming out can be used to probe the temperature. Some of them are not necessarily um, non-contact because you need to bring some object whose properties, whose optical properties changes with light next to the object uh, that you are measuring, but still they are a good way uh, to get a, a good full image temperature distribution. Uh, what we will do in next lecture is we go to thermoreflectance imaging where the change in surface reflection coefficient with temperature is used as a thermometer and you can see that this is a way to get the highest spatial resolution with simultaneously very fast temperature measurement down to 800 picosecond and uh, look forward to see you at the next lecture.